Stay young, keep your wheels in motion. You got everything that you need. Stay young with your rock and roll hand. All the best things in life free. We are here for the season's finale of Crest in the presence of the godfather of Welsh surfing. Pete PJ Jones, style master, pioneer, legend, guru. This man has a fantastic life story. And for this extra special double to finish season one, he's telling it all to Crest. The date is special, the place and the personalities are too. It's episodes 23 and 24. Ooh. What a moment! We are in hallowed company. It's PJ himself. Welcome to Crest. Are you PJ. really in hallowed company? Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you looking so fit and well. Welcome. Uh, well, I feel you know for my age group, I'm lucky being a little guy. Um, rugby guys my age, their hips are gone, shoulders are gone. <laughs> um, but all it's all right for me, and uh, I go in the water a lot as much as I can. You know, I love going in. That's it. You know. Well, as Tom was telling me, that as a writer, the one thing you can't say is that you lost for words, PJ, <laughs> uh, or that you can't think of what to write. But it's hard. How do we begin to introduce a person like PJ, Tom? Do you know what? We couldn't actually think of what to say. Uh, okay, okay, we could. Uh, but it's interesting to realise when sometimes it actually is relevant to trot out some of those old idioms. Uh, and right now, I genuinely do think that we're sitting with the one Welsh surfer for whom it pretty much is safe to say needs no introduction, because he wouldn't. Uh, those, those two letters, surfing's equivalent of a knighthood, isn't it? Becoming uh, initials instead of being yes, instead of your given name. Yes, that would be nice, yeah. PJ. <laughs> no. <laughs> They're a Welsh surfing institution, uh, iconic. Uh, and what iconic means... Uh, is that when you hear the words, uh, or in his case, the letters, that they recall an image in the mind. Uh, that, that is what the word iconic means. Uh, and that is the case with PJ. There's a style and a look on a surfboard, a way of standing, a way of talking, which has become an image for what, is, for what the best Welsh surfing ever should be. So, PJ... <laughs> Feel emotional. <laughs> you do your... get a really good right. introduction there. Uh, of course, because yeah. <laughs> it's possible... Yeah. It's, it's possible. Um, you go, yeah. You know, it's, it's so... Surfing, for me, is real life. You know, I mean, and I did it in the beginning when I started doing it. I did it. It found me. I never chose surfing. Um, so I was swimming a lot in Bishop Gore. I was captain of the swimming team in Bishop Gore. And uh, I went down to Langham one day and one of my mates was serving. He said, have a go on my board. And first thing, I said, no, I don't want to have a go on your board. He said, go on, have a go. It's okay, give me your board. It's a really old, big, mile, you know, like a Bilbo. No, it was a tiki, actually, a nine-foot tiki. Anyway, um, I ended up paddling out, because I'm good at gymnastics or whatever. Front crawl, paddled out, and... A wave came around, a little bit of white water. I turned the board round, bounced along, jumped up, and it was like, shh, you know, I didn't choose that. I thought, my God, I love this. And, you know, I wouldn't come out the water for ages. And uh, Phil Hayward, who lives in Australia now, a friend of mine, and Spike, his nickname is, uh, you know, they were waving at me on my board back. And, uh, you know, I gave it back, I thought, i got to do this. So uh, I dropped out completely. I mean, you're looking at a real beach bum. My dad, who went to work many years ago, mm. he's not alive now, he um, wanted me to get a real job. So dad would say, you know, get a job. You know, I don't want a job, I want to surf. <laughs> and in those days, it was a really... You know, a bit of a hippie, uh, bohemian -y, you know, thing to do, no work, do what you can, you know, to surf. You know. But anyway, I dropped out and surfed. And, you know, I'm a believer in, if you do what you love to do in life, whatever it is, music, writing, painting, or, 
If you love it that much, you will be successful at it. And here we are with you guys. And I love where I am. Yeah. Uh, you know? It's a beautiful spot. I mean, if you live in Hawaii, uh, and you go in the water there, or Australia, and you're not a local, it's going to be tough getting waves. Here, in Britain, I love, you know, I can go anywhere, and I know loads of people. And I'm able to uh, meet lovely old guys, get in the water and do it. So, you know. Joe, that's fabulous. You, you've done half our job for us, there, with, 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 with that intro. What, we, we, we're going to actually, uh, we're going to sing your praises a tiny I bit do black more, actually, a bit before fine. we start. No, that's all right. Yeah. That, that's grand. Because we've got to make sure that our, uh, that, that, that perhaps the one or two of our listeners who isn't aware of, of the background is, is, is filled in here because uh, you know we know a lot of people probably know these stories yeah. um, but also I, I think it's possible um, that there are people who know the name and the character but not oh. quite what underpins it so um, for the benefit of uh, our listeners um, PJ is in my opinion this country's trailblazing surfer uh, in terms of getting out there and, and putting us on the international scene. Now, you, you may remember that we said the date was special. Uh, well, if you do pick up our episodes on release date, then it's October the 1st, uh, and that's the day that PJ won his European title in 1977, and the day his son James was born. So, uh, happy birthday, James, by the way. Now, about that contest win, well, by holding a European title from 1977 to 1981, PJ ensured that Wales sat atop of this continent's surf scene during crucial formative years in our culture. Present or nearby for many of the defining moments in international surfing history, PJ can also f- offer first-hand experience of some of the greatest tales our sport can offer. Stories from the gladiatorial days of early pro <laughs> surfing, when the world tour and travelling scene were full of characters, chances, and pioneers and legends. He's also the one Welsh surfer to have essentially become a brand, which when you think about what that means, is a very special achievement. Iconic. Now there's the word again. It's true though. When you look at the way a sporting career can go, there are ceilings and stages, uh, winning locally, winning nationally, then internationally, then transcending that to become a personality, uh, and finally, perhaps a brand, if that is the right word, or an institution, an icon. It's an idea perhaps associated with the world's biggest nations and the world's biggest sports. But it happens in surfing too, and in PJ, uh, Wales has such a figure. And the best thing about that, they say, don't meet your heroes. But when you meet PJ, you find a person who to this day loves everything about surfing. I'm laughing, guys, I love you. (laughs) But you love everything about surfing, about Wales and about its people. Here's the grand finale. A person like your son who we spoke to in a previous episode who is both from and of this country's surfing community. For all he's done, he still likes nothing more than paddling out and meeting fellow surfers, whatever their ability. All that's needed is a desire to spread the stoke. Now, we mentioned that you're listening to this on his son's birthday. Well, at the time of this recording, PJ has just had a special birthday himself. So maybe we should begin with another happy birthday too, Pete. Happy birthday. Thank happy birthday much. too. Did you uh, yes, celebrate yes. in style? Um, we didn't do a lot. I, all my grandchildren came down. Yeah. And, uh, we had a lovely uh, meal, but we didn't go out. But uh, the biggest party I had was my 50th birthday, right. 20 years ago, in the King's Head over the road. And that was pretty special. But uh, yeah, we had a lovely day. You know, 70 is a weird number. Sort of from the neck up every year I get younger, but from the neck down I get <laughs> older. <laughs> Shit. You know, but the older we get, stay young up here, you know. To be a surfer when you're older is more difficult. Right, yeah. Um, and I look up to the guys older than me, you know, like, uh, you know, all the guys in Wales. There's not too many, but there are a lot, and I love that. Whether they're probably not as good as they were, but it's lovely they're still doing it. Gives, it still love gives that. you the inspiration. Yeah, I mean, um, you know. Uh, and yes. You mentioned mm. there that, that the big birthday you celebrated yeah. was, was your 70th. Seven, yes. Um, yeah. So that puts you as being born in 1950, and that's a very different world to the one that we're in now. Oh, totally. And 
Oof, tough question that. I mean, in a way, uh, the world now is amazing, mm. but things like mobile phones, you know, when I go in the water, jump in my van, I love not having a phone there because you're free. Now mm. the world is speedy mm. and then speeded up. We're surfing when we go down the beach. Whew, everything calms down and relaxes our mind, our body. Uh, that's a bit I like about it. I love the spiritual bit about it more than the ego bit about it. Mm. You know, it's good to be good at it. Mm. You know, when we were young, you know, it's like you look cool, you go down the beach, you know, all the girls, you know, hey, how are you doing? You know, you know they like you. But surfing, you can do it all your life, like your dad, you know, you, James. Mm. It's magic. It's uh, not like a sport. It's a way of life. It mm. never will be a sport to me, really, although I won a lot. It's not a sport. It's judgeable and, you mm. know. And, and you were born in, in Devon originally to Welsh parents, but you saw the error of your you ways should, when you were one it, year old. You, and you... Tom, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> bastard. I, well, I, I, I was born in Watford as well. That's what I say to people is I saw the error of my ways when I was a couple of months old and yeah, moved to Wales. Uh, so no, my, dad, that, Tom. my dad was very Welsh. My mother's an English farming lady. Oh, right. Still alive down the road. Right. 96. Yeah. Yes. So you rescued yes, her over to Wales as well then? Yeah. Well, I was born in Devon, and I love the Devon show, you know, bugger you, Peter, what are you doing, boy? You all talk <laughs> like that. But, I mean, I was in Wales, sorry, three years old, and I'm Welsh, right? But I'm not 100% Welsh. This is bloody annoying. The rugby comes on. I love Wales, I want you to win. Yeah, of course I bloody do. Come on, Wales. And then... Some of the Welsh, some of the very aggressive, fucking English, I hate the English, fuck, fuck the fucking English. And then one said to me, you, you Welsh, Pete? Yeah, of course I am, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where were you born, Pete? Oh, well, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's that little bit, it's only a, a minor thing. Right? So, oh, that's fantastic, <laughs> Pete. So you, you, you um, going back to your, your, your oranges and of your surfing. Yeah. You were relatively late starting, so yeah, you were 17, 17, 17 years yeah. old. But in those days, um, there were hardly any young kids you needed a car. The right. boats were nine foot, yeah. heavy, you know. But where, So the spiritual start, the spiritual home for you was Langland. Langland Reef. Yes. Um, I lived in Britain Mill then, yeah. uh, down the road. And, uh, you know, and Langland, even now, for me, is... Uh, lovely, you know, it's the older you get, you can get out and it's big when the waves are really, really big, you can get out easily. Mm. And I love that. I love living here, mm. but the older I get, paddling out here is tough. It's just got, got to go special meaning for you. Yeah. yeah. So I love Lang. I mean, we've all got our favourite spots wherever we live, mm. but Lang, and to me, it's probably one of the best mm. places in South Wales for ease of going in, you know. Mm. Uh, and the before the, the actual surfing started, you were in mm. Bishop Gore uh, Grammar yeah, School, is it school. Grammar School? Yeah. 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 And, no, um, no girls. <laughs> no, thank God for But that. you were a, a keen swimmer and a keen gymnast, as you said. Yeah, earlier. I was captain of the uh, swimming team. Uh, and then I went to London one day, like I said, training. Yeah. And a guy just said, have I got on my board? And I said, no, you know, I was looking at the waves, but I didn't understand, you know, the feeling of the waves. And uh, as I said, you know, I had to go on the board and I was going to be a PE teacher. I was um, accepted in Kinkhoid College, Cardiff. Excuse yeah. me, croaking by the way. Kinkhoid <laughs> College, Cardiff. And uh, I did two months there. And uh, Gareth Edwards, the rugby player, the third year. And right. Lynn Davis was wow. an athletics teacher. And I remember leaving college because surfing had hit me you know about only about oh, four months earlier and I went to see the uh, head of the department Eric Jones I think his name was and uh, I said I'm leaving he said you're leaving you do you realize you have nine applications for every person that's accepted what are you going to do I go it's surfing and it says 1968 so Eric said, 
surfing? What the hell is that? Mm. So, you know, and I just left then. Yeah. So really, it drove me, surfing did drive me away from thinking of work, away from thinking of money. So I, I never had any money then, you know. And it was pure joy of doing it. And I thought this is more important than sitting in an office all day, mm. like every five days a week, um, to earn money. Because I understood that the surfing on in South Wales only works certain times of the day. Yeah, so long and well, low yeah. tide. Mm. So low tide, oh, it's at midday, right. The wind's northerly, swell is booming, the wave's going to be brilliant. Can you imagine having a real job? I'd be yeah, you can't get anything in can you? Monday morning, 12 o'clock, line, it's going to be good. I'd be gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be gone. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to do it and try and live off the minimal amount of money as I can in the beginning. And, you know... Probably it taught me things where we are now, where we're sitting now, is a place that thought, God, I'd never be able to buy this. Do you know yeah. when you get a job as a whatever it is, postman, it's a great job. But surfing led me down the routes and shit, I should write a book about it. I was engaged to another woman when I met my lovely wife now, because of, you know, it's another story. But, Oh, central that, right, place yeah. in the in the Welsh surf scene back then, yeah, wasn't it? Well, and they used to surf Aberavon a lot. So, who were the sort of you know what was the Aberavon scene like, um, and who were the kind of characters that you, well, you met in Aberavon? Um, I lived with? in Print Mill in the early days. So right. I drive up the uh, you know Fabian Way, and um, there was Albert Harris, um, Linda, her brothers Mark right. and Tom, um, another guy Bob Skateball Horn. Really, really good. Right. A um, few others, can't remember all their names. Oh, Christos, right. uh, Mar uh, Martin Phillips, really right. good, lovely. Uh, we used to go there, and um, this was pre uh, when they built, you know, they did all the building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They built it all up. Pre days, still a good way, but in those days, it was amazing. You could get out along the pier. Right. Uh, the rip there, you just sit in the uh, by the pier, and you'd be out there. It helps you run like, like a river. Yeah, so they were lovely days. And the left would bowl in towards you. Mind you, the water was stinking. <coughs> it was at the, um, the steel company, and in yeah. those days, you know, the probably health and safety was totally different. Mm. But I was never ill surfing there. Yeah. And I remember part of out one day and it was steam coming off the water, like yeah. steamy, and you know, you could smell it, or the chemicals yeah, all the of it. toxins, yeah. But, you know, it was never ill, I think. But Arbor Avon was brilliant. Did, really brilliant. did you think being a, a swimmer, that meant oh, you yeah. caught lots of waves, then that meant yeah. you improved well, quickly? When I started, right, um, I'd never been in the water in Langland in 1967. The guy lent me the board, because I front crawled it, mm. you know, I could get out mm. and I stood up on the first wave and rode it all the way in mm. like a gorilla because I'm little right stance you know, mm. I was able to ride it all the way in mm. and uh, you know I'm lucky it's my gift if you like mm. in that way of sport we're all good at something mm. but James you're bloody good powerhouse you are do the turns bang <laughs> but I mean we're all good at stuff uh, but you know I like the the rhythm of it. Yeah. I'm more of a Jerry Lopez was a guy I met, mm. surfed against. Mm. For me, he was. I want to be like that. And, and when you started competing, then yeah, um, was that originally the idea was that if you could win mm. contests, you could yeah. then get exactly onto trips, well, and then you'd get to so yeah. you won your way yeah. to meeting Jerry Lopez well, and that kind of thing. When I um, started, I'd read a magazine, an old surfer magazine, or something. You know, I had no money. The, God, the waves are great there. And then um, 
some said, well, if you get in the British team, you know, they you they send you away to the World Contest free of charge or whatever. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll do that, and I'll try and get in the British team, and I did in like '72. I thought if I do that, and you know, we had a trip to San Diego way, way back. This would be pre-pro days. Mm. And for me, it will always be the best world contest I've ever been in. Mm. Um, no money involved. Mm. And everybody was there. I mean, the world today is contests everywhere. Mm. And in those days, you all met together. And then you all went for like five months. You didn't see anybody mm. or whatever. Mm. So I do love that. I did love that. So when I walked into the uh, hotel in San Diego um, with Gordon Burgess from Jersey, Steve Harewood, Graham Nile, uh, Charlie Williams, Chris Jones and me, mm. we walked in there and all the teams were right there. It was Jerry Lopez, Mark Richards. He was young. Like, he's, quite, he's quite a bit younger than me. I think he's about 66 maybe. And they were all there. And... The hotel was sponsored, sponsored by Coca-Cola, wow. right? <laughs> so in those days, we walked in, we were given these rooms at the, like, five-star hotels. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. Me and Tony Howe, do you know the name? He I was know. a manager yeah. of... Yeah, <clears> he, he lived in Fourth Calls very briefly in the, yeah, in the 2000s. He, he went to the police, didn't he? Yeah, he died a few years ago. Oh, did he? Oh, I didn't know that. But uh, Tony. Tony and I... Went in with two guys to every room, right? We went in the room, it was luxury, and we were starving, right? So, uh, and the hotel's buzzing, you know, music and smell in the air, you know, can it, you know 72. <laughs> and so, uh, Tony and I said, he said, We're hungry, let's we'll order a meal, okay? I said, Right, so we ordered a meal. There's a knock on the door, and in a silver thing, we had lobs and all this, and we sat there, it's all free, so. We had this meal. Great. Oh, uh, Reg Pradesh, who was the team manager then, said, we're going to have to meet tonight about seven. So me and Tony I went down. Said, oh, great. Is it a fantastic hotel? It's fantastic. You know, we love this. And Reg said, yeah, we've gone out for tea now. Tony and I said, well, we've just ordered tea from the room. I said, well, no, they don't give you free meals here. You have the room. Oh, no. But, so... <laughs> We, we, Tony went over to the receptionist and we probably spent about £100 <laughs> it's a night 72 but they didn't charge us we were laughing oh, but it was fantastic. one of those days you know and uh, so I do love that rawness wildness of those days and everybody's had Corky Carroll was around and all the famous guys around you So you were uh, moving a couple of years forward from from that uh, that trip. You in '76, the year of yeah. busting down the door of the film. Yeah. You ended up going to the ultimate proving ground, which was yeah. Hawaii. Yeah. So what was yeah. that like back then? Well, when I went there, uh, me, uh, Nigel Simon, Steve Daniels, uh, and a friend of mine, Phil Evans, four of us, oh, and Graham Nile, five of us. Um, we, uh, well, I do love Hawaii. I thought this is it, uh, the mecca of surfing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I was 26 years old and I thought, I am up for any sort of waves, you know, I am ready for it, uh, which was great. And I did go in the water a lot in the beginning, but I, t I realized Hawaii and whales surfing boards you use totally different. Yeah. Um, I took a six foot two Bruce Palmer and a board I won in a contest in Devon. A cream honey, seven foot seven red gunny board. And I only took it thinking I'd never ride it. It was in Wales, more gunny, you know. Uh, I went out sunset, first day on the Bruce Palmer. And the way to me, they were about, <clears throat> they were about eight foot but warm paggies, you know, mm. in Wales, that's quite big. Yeah. Um, 
paddle out there and my goose paddle but dropped in on this frame and it just, 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 just skated in, you know, so wide at the turn, tried to do a turn, skate in. Yeah. So I went out, picked up my cream honey board, magic, like solid. You can't wiggle it waggle, you drop down, do a turn, wait, do another turn, you know, learn about the wave, you know. Um, so Hawaii, I realised I'm in the place, if you're good at surfing, or you think you're good at it, you could be a British champion, or a European champion. You go to Hawaii, they say, hey, bro, see how good you really are. You know, there's 30 of them out there. You think, shit, he's good, he's got bloody hell. You know, they're all good. But uh, I do remember a big day, sunset, paddling out, I was feeling a little bit, and it, to me, it was 12 foot plus sets, you know? And I'm paddling at this lovely sunset, you know, you, you can paddle, you've been there. No, I haven't right. been to Hawaii. Um, and I saw a set coming in and down this way, drops this, whoosh, turning, you know? It's a bloody woman, I thought, it's a, girl, it's a lady, small, but it's Margot Oberg, the world right, ladies' yeah. champ. And yeah. I thought, I'm all right, I'm going to be all right. <laughs> so, but uh, I rode fairly big waves, but when it was really big there, uh, I mean, it's another world. It's so dangerous, yeah. and really dangerous. And uh, uh, I mean, one morning we woke up and there was the uh, whole of the coast. It's got a mistiness about it, right? And we drove down to Waimea, and as we're driving down, it was a very nice day, it was cloudy and misty, and Christ, you could hear the ground, you know. The whole of the coast, North Shore was closing out, and we went to Waimea, um, and the police were everywhere, and they were, the, the main road in Waimea, <coughs> excuse me, was shut, because of the waves were going through the beach. Wow. And uh, we went down the point, the end of the bay, and some of the big wave riders were there, you know, they were standing like this, and we were standing like that. Mm. And uh, the waves at Waimea, I've got a little film of it, to show you. I'd to see that, yeah. for sure, yeah. Yeah, and it looked, to me, 40 foot, breaking across the bay. And then, we were there about an hour, and then one guy, I heard them cheering, one guy walks down, with a gun in its hands, like 11 foot. Yeah. Don't know who he was, the big guy. And he goes right by the corner of White Beard, the only place to go, short break. Fucking hell, it was huge. And they were waiting, he waited and paddled out. Didn't go right out the back, so it got some in the middle of it, but caught a wave, rode it to the beach, it came out, and they were cheering that he actually went in. Yeah. You know? Incredible. Right? And I thought I'd never be able to surf. Go yeah. in there. So you were in there. Premier Division, I mean, Hawaii, to me, there are other countries where I have great waves, but Hawaii is. Mm. And they are, the local people are lovely. Mm. And Pete, you stayed on that trip, I think, you were staying in a house next door to Rabbit? Yeah. And a couple of other guys? Yeah, Kua Lima, um, uh, so uh, rental houses. Right. Kua Lima, it was called. Um, stayed there, yeah, with Nigel, Steve. Graham Nile, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. forgot to tell you something. When the uh, YBA was closing out, Graham Nile in the night had been in the house that was on the end of YBA Bay, and the house was knocked off its supports. So you have to have a word with Graham about that. It's mm. unbelievable. Mm. Anyway, what were you saying? Yeah, no, I was just um, saying that you were obviously staying next to yeah. a couple of. Oh, yeah, the boys, yeah. Which. Not a big deal for me. Yeah. Um, but you knew them, you I, obviously knew them quite well. Well, I, not very well. I mean, I, Rabbit, MR, um, Ian Cairns, uh, uh, Krieg and Brian Cregan, I think, the other one, and Pete Townend. Oh, right. Uh, um, I didn't know them. Yeah. Um, Nigel, Steve, you know. We knew of them. I knew Rabbit because I did compete against him further down the line. Yeah. But... I do remember not seeing any of them for a while uh, in the water, except for MR. Yeah. Mark Richards yeah. wandered down the North Shore and do that. And 
you know, I remember, well, didn't think anything of it. And I was younger, and my hair was even longer, and I'm brown and stuff. And um, one morning, um, I walked, so we were staying with Alan Rich for a, for a week, you know, the guy who made uh, Playground St. Paradise. Oh, yeah. Yeah, stayed with Alan Rich, me, all the boys, only for like four days. Yeah. Um, but when we were living in the other place, further down the line, uh, I got up and I went in Kami's, you know the break? Mm -hmm. Next Sunset. Right, You've right, been there, Tom? The supermarket break, yeah, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't been to the North Shore uh, either, actually. All right. Well, I paddled out there early morning and I'm on my own and uh, paddled around. I didn't notice. But then there was a big Hawaiian guy sitting only about five metres away from me. And there's another big Hawaiian guy sitting about five metres away from me. Sitting there. So, you know, oh, hello. And one of the Hawaiian guys, I'll never forget, he's big, he's mean. I thought, no, I'm not Bruce Lee. I'm in trouble, yeah? He said, where the fuck are you from? He said, I didn't feel scared. He said, Wales. Where the fuck is Wales? <laughs> well, you got England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. Oh! So, Great Britain or UK, can't even remember what he said. And they paddled off. I thought, God, that was shit. They were going, you know, anyway, surfed for the whole time. And then, about a week later, we heard Rabbit was in trouble because uh, the Hawaiians. Uh, Rabbit's a lovely guy, one of the best surfers ever. He was a poor guy when he started. He wanted to be world champion, and he did do it. Uh, but he wouldn't come out, so there was uh, some of the bad boys uh, going to sort it out, mm. you know. Mm. And uh, so the best in down the door, we were all there. Uh, Steve Daniel, Nigel was there, Graham. But we were, you know, very British in the way mm. we wandered around, uh, the way we surfed, mm. you know, Hawaiians, uh, sorry, Australians. They're so competitive. Mm. Uh, they went in and then there was a vibe though. I didn't notice, and it was something I, you know, I didn't enjoy sometimes. But I don't, Hawaiians, you know, mm. we are lucky living in Wales. How many Hawaiians come to Wales and try and drop in on us in Langland? None. <laughs> How many Brazilians come? None. But if you live in Hawaii and you, yeah, the breaks yeah. away, you were brought up with your grandparents all your life. Yeah. And all of a sudden now, you're in Pipeline Sunset Beach and you've got 20 Aussies yeah. coming out and the Aussies, like, they're lovely but it's so competitive. Our whites have had enough of this. Boom. It, it, um, was, it was a negotiated kind of house yeah. arrest for Rabbit and those in the end. They were well, basically I, allowed to I didn't know all about it, yeah. Tom. I didn't know all about it. But yeah, Rabbit uh, was very... Uh, it was the right thing to do to stay out of the way of the bad boys. Yeah. Because um, probably people who didn't serve Hawaiians who yeah. are tough guys if you want me to sort them out I'll do it yeah, yeah. there probably were a couple of those going on, but same as the world is now you know yeah yeah but you know I loved Hawaii and I you know. 76 as well trip to Hawaii yeah um what what's happened after after 72 yeah. The biennial idea of the world contest, the 72 was yeah. the last one, and it's essentially replaced by yeah, the Smirnoff, which is yeah, like the kind of unofficial well, world championship, and that's what you were there for, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, because of the, um, uh, all the racism in South Africa going on, mm. the world contest stopped yeah. for four years, which I am a bit gutted about, because when I was 24, uh, I was more hungry and more competitive then, right. mm. so there wasn't a world contest. But not that mm. I'd ever won it, but I might have had an even better result. Uh, when I was young, I needed that, you know. Mm. Um, and for me, when I uh, won the Welsh in 1972, you know, for me that was the most magic one I'd won. Yeah. You know, I won a lot all the way through, but I, I thought maybe, uh, you know, I loved surfing, I thought I can be good at this. But when you say you can be good at something, it doesn't mean you are going to be good at it. So you need to be told by what you've done. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when I won the, it's like probably you, James, when you win it first time, mm. 
you know, you drive home. Yeah. You know, and when I won the European, <coughs> excuse me, when James was born, mm. for me, that was the pinnacle. I'll never beat that because I, to be any better, you cannot do it living in Great Britain. Yeah. Mm. No way you can do it. No way. Mm. And people say to me, oh, you're, you're a European champion now. Yeah, it's fantastic to win it in Wales as well. Yeah. You we're we're going to come to that in a little bit more detail, oh, okay. actually. Cause, Sorry, cause but, it, well, no, yeah. but, but, but we'll... Uh, yeah. Because there's quite a story behind that, actually, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. Can I just ask about the yeah. Smirnoff before we move yeah. on? Because you competed yeah. in that, didn't you, yeah. in 76? in the yeah. amateur event, yeah. not in the pro event. Right. And... Um, I remember my first round on a big red board. Yeah, uh, this is the cream honey one. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the big cream honey. Mm. Um, I uh, no leash either, which <laughs> make you all laugh now because I surf a lot now. People are not going to like this either, but riding a longboard with a leash on, yeah, your level of tricks, walking, talking with your feet, is stuck. A bit, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, to do with Hawaii, when I went down the beach, there, all the really good guys had no leash on. If you wore a leash, kook, you're a kook, <laughs> man. You're a kook. So I took the leash off because the leashes in those mm. days, my were like bungees. Christ, if you got hit by that, oh, yeah. bloody hell. But um, I remember and I. I, I was equal first in the first round with Mark Liddell, Buttons, mate. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got through to the semis. And in the semis, I think it was Buttons, I was against Buttons, Dame Kalo won it, the amateur event. Right. Um, but I do remember I was getting all stoked up because I thought, ooh, I can, can make this final. And Sunset Beach again, because um, I'm a goofy foot, right start, a little bit more awkward. Yeah. And it's only 10 minutes in, uh, I dropped it at a fairly big weight, 10 foot, I suppose, I don't know, came up, oh, it's stored it a bit, oh, it's all going over me, barrel, yeah. but it blew me out, blew me off the board, the board had gone, oh. and that was it. Uh, I had to swim in, by the time I got my board, couldn't get back, so I mm. got knocked out. Uh, but, you know... How I long were the heats back then? Um, 20 minutes. Oh, so there was just no way you Or back maybe back. 25 minutes. In yeah. sunset. <laughs> yeah, no chance. But one thing i got to say, when I uh, went down for everybody's around there, you know, and you know, when we're on our own, British, you're in a quiet zone, and all Hawaiians mm. around, you know, they're all that. And I remember the big... Uh, it was off, you know, everywhere. And one of them, I heard this guy say, Pete! I looked around, it was a rabbit cat guy, the guy who organised, the Hawaiian guy. Yeah. Good luck, man! Oh, oh. You know? And I thought, oh, great. Acceptance. Now, I, now that was lovely yeah. from a guy who's, who is the, the Don. Of, oh, he's one, so of, the, yeah, one yeah, of the greatest Hawaiians of all time. Yeah. And he did say good luck. I'll mm. never forget that. Funny what we remember. And, and speaking of Hawaiian legends, you met and yeah. surfed with Eddie Aikau. Yes. Well, he didn't know I was in the water at Lanya Kea. Yeah. <laughs> I think Steve might have been with me and Nigel. Can't give a part of that. And uh, I can't. Six foot Lanya Kea, right hander, right? And I part of And I do remember. This guy snorting as he paddled, yeah, short hair, he had a little bit of a turn, and uh, he, he went past me. Aloha! Gone. You know? Yeah. So that was Eddie Ike. But, you know, we all meet people, don't we? I mean, Kelly Slater, the other year, we all meet. But all the old ones, I was lucky enough to meet. Yeah. A real surfed for other reasons in the beginning. All of them. Mm. Um, and I do like that about that. I mean, everybody surfs for the right reasons now, but a lot surf for money. Mm. Sponsorship. Da -da. All the old guys, they didn't want to work. They're probably like me, really. I don't want to work. I just surf every day, you know, do this. So maybe they, they were like that. But for me as well, going back in time, 
when I was in uh, San Diego in the World Cup uh, 72, and then Steve Harrod and I, all the heats were pinned up in the in the uh, in the in the main uh, reception area of the hotel. <laughs> they were pinned up, and I went walked over and said, "Who are you against, Steve?" And they were all in there, you know, of the year. I said, "All right," it said uh, Jerry Lopez, Hawaii, or oh, Pete Jones, England, uh, Pete Townend, Australia. Christoph Bordenhoff, French champion, and I had a New Zealander guy, I can't remember, I thought, oh God, I'm surfing against Jerry Lopez. First round of the World Contest, yeah. that was magic, and we were at um, Oceanside, the name of the break, and I can't remember what colour I had on, I think Jerry had a yellow vest on, and he came over, as we walked down, we all, you know, as you do, came up, hey man, what's your name? I said, Pete, he said, I'm Jerry. And we went in. How did that play with your mind? Was it like a Jedi mind trick that yeah. Kelly Slater does on his... Yeah, uh, his, uh, yeah but it was totally different right. then than it is now, James. Right. You know, then it was so laid-back competitive. Now it's all competitive, bang, bang, bang. Because mm. I do remember a set coming in at Oceanside. And, okay, was it Jerry? Anyway, one of them said, do you want this one? Do you want because it's another one behind it? Right, yeah. There's another one behind it. So I th that was the difference. So you, I mean, you had but, to go. You know, but now, now I mean, if I was competing now, I wouldn't like to be the man I am now as I was then because I did want to be a winner for a while and I, I did feel aggressive to other people I wanted to beat. But that's now I'd give them a hug, <laughs> yeah. you know, maybe in Wales and in Britain, mm. I would be more aggressive in approach to the whole thing, you know. Mm. Some kind of rubbish, really, that, you know. <laughs> surfing's <laughs> nothing to do with that, but surfing is, is magic. The waves are breaking, sun is making me smile. So going back to Europe then, Pete, um, we've actually tried asking James about this. Have you? But yes, but he's just got one... I know what you're going to he's ask. He's got one figure. I need in your mind. He's got the, only the one figure. It's eight Welshes. Is oh. that correct? <laughs> yeah. I won the Welsh 72, 73, second in 74. Pete Bounds, well done, mate. 75, I won it. Yeah. Pete Bounds, 76. I won it 77, 78, 79. Mark Scottfield, well done, mate. Won it 1980. Yeah. I won it 81. Uh, Mark Scottfield won it again 82. And I won it in 83. And I retired. I was 33 years old. Gosh, yes. I had a little boy, a little girl. And I thought, well, a little bit like retire when you're on top is rather a nice feeling rather than keep doing it be a champion and then go do 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 so um but oh I don't want to say what I'm thinking <laughs> Kelly Slater you should have retired when you won 11 world titles because <laughs> you are the best ever you, told. <laughs> you are the best he is the best then but do you know what I mean I don't mean that funny but mm. it's like but you can rattle off your your like wins at the Welsh like off yeah. the back of your hands like yeah. you've got it written down there. I was, like what other sort of uh, I was gutted in the British. Um, but you did win that, in though, didn't Watergate. You? Yeah, in Watergate seventy five, I came out the water and I thought I'd won it. Take a newling who is probably my favourite well a uh, British surfer of all time. Tigger was magic. Um, Tigger was in it. Me, Tigger, Bruce Palmer in the final, uh, Rod Sumter, I think. Can't remember the other one. Anyway, they get down to the last two when you, you know, you're in the last two. Second place, Pete Jones, bollocks. Second, so I, I second in 75. 76, Graham Nyla beat me, so second. 77, 
in Clyde. Bob Mayer from Jersey, I was second again. So I had three seconds, 78 in Wales. You ain't beating me in Wales, I thought. And I won it in Wales. So I did three seconds. Um, when in that, you know, in 78, I won the British. Yeah. But when I won that, I was uh, Welsh, British, and European champion that in that year. So that was like an ego massage beyond. Gosh, yes. Yeah. And I suppose. Everybody wanted to be your friend that year, I bet. Well, the real ones, the people who don't know you, the real friend, who surf, say, Do you surf? Yeah, I do. Oh, God. Like people love surfing for the right reasons. Mm. So the older I get, I'm more, I'm more, I love that more, you know? Yeah. And all the old champions in Britain, you know, the boards we rode were different, single fins. And for me in the beginning, uh, I used to go down to Cornwall. Who have I got to beat then? Right? There were lots of them there. There was one standing on a plinth, Tigger Newton, was. If he's on form and I'm on form, still don't know if I can beat him. You know, because right. he had such a new Ray F style of surfing. A bit like Jerry Lopez, a shot of Jerry Lopez doing a pop and turn at pipeline. It's just got something that's, you don't really see anymore, it's a style. MR doing a turn with his arms out. That's what I love. Individuality, I love more than just being good at it, you know? Yeah. We're talking about people beating you of the new ge generation of your yeah. era. Yeah. There's uh, a good friend, obviously, of the show. Um, he was on, on episode 14 and 15, Mark Schofield. Yeah. He yeah. asked us, he wanted to ask you about this. <laughs> Were, uh, he was, was, was he one of the only guys of the new generation who was able to beat you? Yeah, I suppose he was. Because he was. Um, trying to think now, the young ones. Yeah, Mark beat me in Freshwater West in 1980, I think it was. Am I right, Mark? Can't remember. Yeah, I went at 80, went, yeah, 1980. And I was 30 then, and how old is Mark now? He's 56, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so he would have been uh, 17, young, but he was good here. And Simon Tucker was fantastic. Mm. There's loads of you, uh, Brad. Yeah. You know, loads of really good. But he did beat me. I thought, oh, well, shit, you know. You know, celebrity. But he uh, he did beat me twice in the Welsh. But Pete Bounds beat me twice right. in the Welsh. Yeah. Pete and I, same age. Pete's a lovely guy and solid as a rock sort of thing. You know, really um, steady and had a lovely style. For a big guy, he looked quite light footed. He either went in drunk or something. <laughs> no, it was good. Let's ask about the European Championship yeah. then as well. Because um, yeah. we're, we're, we're going up and down with our yeah. chronology, but I suppose we're working up then. You yeah. know, we got, we're winning Welshers, winning Britishers. Let's ask yeah. about winning the European Champs. Yeah. That was in Fresh West. Yes. How, did, how does it feel to be Fantastic. European well, champion? When I went... 77, when start, yeah. Yeah, so when I started doing it, uh, started the contest, um, I felt I was in with a really good chance of doing it. Mm. Um, there weren't huge amount of, in my mind, people to worry about. There was uh, Gerard Dabody, a French guy, uh, who was the reigning champion, I was like that, yeah. Um, Nigel Chops, uh, Bobby Mayo. Um, I think there's only one Portuguese guy in it then, Spanish, and in the semis, though, um, an American guy surfing for Ireland was in it, Kevin Norton. Right, yeah. Right, who writes books. From Norton, um, uh, of Norton and Peterson, yeah, the travel adventures, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin adventures, was in yeah. semi yeah. I thought, ooh, you, you know. The iconic Tavarua shot of jumping off the boat is Norton. And yes, Peterson, that's and, the, and the one of them waking yeah. up after camping on the beach yeah, in Central that's America. Right. But he right. had thought, but then I won the semi and got it final, and then James was born the day before final one and in a way without him being having a little boy you know when you have your first child something about it isn't it hits mm. you you know it's all, 
Um, but I wasn't there when he was born, because I was in the continent, so he was born 50 miles away, you know, and I'm in fresh water. But I do remember paddling out and thinking, you know, it's, it's great having a little boy now, I'm going to win this. So James gave me a little, you know, he did help me being a dad. And so, spiritual way, it was meant to happen, really. And our, and listeners, our listeners are downloading this uh, on October the 1st, uh, which is the day oh gosh. that this happened. Yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah, that was... I mean, trouble is, uh, I didn't see James two days later, because when the contest was held, um, driving home Teddy Hurst, uh, was following me because he was in the final, came fourth, I think. Bouncy did well, mind. He came third in the European. So Bouncy was always there, yeah. you know, always there. Anyway, we got into Carmarthen. Uh, Ted was behind my van, broke down. So I was stuck in Carmarthen the day I was going to see James. Oh, and we didn't come back to see James till the day after. And my lovely wife, you've got to have a good woman, otherwise, phew, I wouldn't be here. Uh, I'd be like a ball, I'd probably be living in a tent. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we and Ted and I, Ted was, saw James, same as me, uh, on the day. So Ted, yes, and he'll always remember that Ted, would, unfortunately, sadly, he died. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but me and Ted, and see James. But winning the European was the peak for me, I mean. Thought I'm never gonna do any better. I may could win it again, maybe, but mm. um, and I wanted to start to earn a little bit of money then because I didn't I didn't actually work till I was the age of it's gonna make you laugh, twenty eight years old. Um, I went you. to <laughs> well, I thought seventy two. What can I do? I got to surf every day. Oh, I go to college, so I went to Swansea Art College. I did photography there, and that was great, because I love art college, mm. full of Bohemian people, art students, and I mm. love that. And uh, I did that, then I beach bummed for a couple of years, and then thought, oh, I'd better start to earn money. Mm. So what can I do? Well, I surfed, I know people all around the world, well, all in Britain, and right, I start, I get a bit of wax, and I'll get some leeches, I'll do a bit of that, you know. And I knew Tim Hayland, as a great oh, guy, Tiki. yeah, mm. who gave me a board in 1969. I could see, uh, which was great, you know, he probably saw a little basket something. Because he was quite posh to me, Tim, you know, his dad was a colonel in other thing. Peter, I'll give you a board, he said, I'll give you a board, okay, give you a board. Right, but, That's a good impression. But uh, <laughs> in those days, you know, to sell all the gear, you know, leeches, wax, mm. you had to know where to get it. These days you put your, you could buy online and stuff, which mm. is, so uh, I started buying stuff and then started selling it. Got a little shop down the road, a little garage mm. shop, and that went here with the best place in, on the, in Flangana, mm. really. So lucky doing that. But European was my, to win that, Tom was, for me, my ego peak. Beyond that, my ego peak didn't need to be massaged anymore. My lifestyle needed to stay the same. So I wanted to surf every day after being a winner of a contest. Well, not every day, but I didn't want to miss a lot. So I, I did this and I able to go in, you know, a lot. And that's the key that it's always been for me. You know, like, surfing is living. Without surfing, what, what would I be like? <laughs> Might pick up my guitar and try and be a Bob Dylan or something. But, you know, surfing is a pure energy thing that the world we live in now is run around by all money, money, money. So, surfing for me, after the European, I just want to surf.